you so much for visiting our channel. We are IFGF Los Angeles, and we are one church that meets in four campuses across Los Angeles. If you want more information on how to attend one of our services or how to get connected with our church, please visit ifgfla.com. This message was recently filmed in our Monrovia campus and features our senior pastor, Daniel Hanafi. We hope you are blessed. God is so good. I love that song. How many of you love that song? Wow. All my life, he has been faithful. All, your, all our lives, he has been faithful. Amen. I just, I don't know. I, every time I sing that song, I'm so, I move to tears because I guess I'm old, so I have a lot to look back on, you know. <laughs> when I look back, it's like a lot of years, and God has been faithful. God has been faithful. So if you're younger than me, you have something to look forward to. God is always faithful. He's so good. Amen. That's why this year the, the, the theme is greater blessing. And we're going to dig deeper on what does that really mean. Praise the Lord. And I'm glad we're in the 21-day fasting. And um, I'm, I'm leaving on this Thursday for uh, time to save money. So I put three trips together. It ends up becoming one super long trip, three and a half weeks. Uh, so I'm going to Indonesia for a week, and then Pakistan for a week, and then Middle East for one and a half weeks. Um, trying to pioneer new work uh, in Middle East, I'm going to Oman, Bahrain, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, and three cities in Saudi Arabia. Uh, all new places that I've never been. It's going to be exciting. In, in, in Pakistan, I'm going also to a new area, uh, Peshawar. Anybody know Peshawar? Well, in my visa <clears throat> that I just got a few days ago, there's two cities that are, that's restricted that I'm not supposed to go to. Uh, one is Quetta. That's near Kandahar, Afghanistan. And the other one is Peshawar, uh, near Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, near the Khyber Pass. But uh, Quetta, we already have six churches, so I'm not worried. But Peshawar, we don't have a church yet, so I'm going there. Um, so pray for me. Uh, that's a dicey city. I was looking at the Wikipedia. It's like the most dangerous city in Pakistan. So um, uh, good times, right? <laughs> uh, the reason I say this is because my wife is not here today. <laughs> don't tell her, please. But I know God is... is, is is sending us. I'm, I'm just the one that goes, but we are all going. The Bible talks about the one that go, the, the one that sows, the one that waters, the one that harvests, all get the same reward. Right? So, aren't you glad I'm going? <laughs> right? Uh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I know. You're such a nice church, right? You love your pastor so much. Amen. So at least pray for me. It's going to be in the website. My, my whole schedule is coming up three and a half weeks. I'll be missing three Sundays, but I will be back. <clears throat> Amen. Praise God. How many of you are excited that the kingdom of God is expanding? <laughs> Hallelujah. Look, um, I just have to tell you this. I have to tell you this. Like, what are we doing on earth anyway? If you really read the whole Bible, there's only two things, right? One is that you would be changed by the word of God that you will become more and more like him. That's discipleship. Two, we're still here on earth, not only to change, to become better, to become more like him. But number two, we are given the privilege to preach the gospel to those that never heard. Amen. Amen. Do you know that the, 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 the statistics in the United States, church budget, United States church budget that goes to unreached areas is less than 0.01% of church budget that goes to people that never heard the gospel. Now, you think about it. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus came. For 2,000 years, this great, the greatest message that you can actually be saved, that you don't have to go to hell because of your sins. The, the greatest message that somebody has paid in full for, your whole, for all your sins, past, present, and future. Is there a greater news 
There is no greater news than that. And we are not even charged to convert people. We are only charged with making this news available to people. And then they make their choice. We are not to impose our beliefs. We are just telling them the good news and they can choose whatever they want. Even so, 2,000 years, there's close to 3 billion people on earth never heard. Never heard. Because the church is just too selfish. We spend most of our, our money and our time just thinking about, talking about, taking care of ourselves. So we, we, we should not do that. Amen. Amen. We need to preach the gospel where it's not convenient, where it is hard, where it's never heard. Look, why Middle East? Why am I going to Middle East? I, I don't like Middle Eastern food. I don't like, I don't particularly like to go there. But the air, that's the area in the world that has the least availability of the gospel. Somebody got to go. Amen. Somebody got to go. And that's what the church is for. So thank you for sending me. I'm, I'm, I'm going knowing that my whole church sent me with the prayers, with all, everything. We're going together. And we are going to do this thing together. Amen. Look, without, without your prayers, I could go and nothing happens, okay? I need miracles happening. You don't just go breezing into Kuwait and something happens. As of this minute, I don't know one person in Kuwait. And I'm leaving Thursday. <laughs> I do not know one person in Kuwait. I know somebody in Qatar that's going to bring me there. What makes me think that something can happen? Unless it's the work of the Lord, unless it's the Holy Spirit, unless you pray, unless we pray, unless God does something that is completely out of my realm of abilities. I can't do anything. I'm, I'm just there to witness God work. Amen? Amen. So let's, let's, let's go together. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, greater blessing. Last week, I... I, I share to you what I believe I receive from the Holy Spirit, the promises of God. I will restore the fortunes of Jacob's tents. Those that don't deserve it, amen, got restored. How many of you are saying yes and amen to that? Yeah, I'm part of Jacob's tents. I, I don't deserve it. God will restore me. He's going to build on top of ruins. How many of you have ruins in your lives? God is going to build something wonderful Right on top of that ruins. Just to show the devil who's greater. Amen. So get ready. Every area of ruins in your life, he's going to build on top of it a beautiful, beautiful uh, thing that he's going to fashion for you. Amen. And then there's going to come songs of what? Thanksgiving and rejoicing. Amen. Amen. Thanksgiving and rejoicing. That's what we want to hear in your lives, in this church. There's not, not, not sounds of grumblings and complaining and moaning and uh, you know, whatever it is. It's going to be songs of thanksgiving, songs of rejoicing. Amen. Not just because things are going well. I mean, anybody can rejoice when things are going well. But yesterday at Bob, we were talking uh, Bob, uh, it's just an awesome uh, men's fellowship here. Every second Saturday of the month, you men are invited. Uh, David French led that so wonderfully, and then all of us share and all that. But we're talking, uh, and, 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 and uh, we were talking about the difference between joy and happiness. What is the difference between joy and happiness? Well, Happiness depends on what happens, right? What, if what happens is good, then you're happy, right? It's the same word. But joy is so much deeper than that. It doesn't matter what happened. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Not the happiness is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. This is the difference between us that knows the Lord and people who do not know the Lord. People who do not know the Lord, they will have strength when they are happy because things that happen are good. But the people of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Where does the joy come from? 
Now, if you go back to scriptures, what is joy anyway? Well, Psalm 51, when David lost, he said, he, 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 you know, Psalm 51, the repentance psalm of David after he was confronted of his sins by, his, by Nathan the prophet. What did he say? Restore unto me, what? The joy of thy salvation. Ah, that gives you a clue. Joy comes from salvation. Amen? How, how secure is your salvation? How secure is your salvation? Well, I don't know about yours. Mine is very secure because it's not dependent on me. Mine is super secure. I know I'm safe because it's not dependent on my performance. It is fully dependent on the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. His death and his resurrection was perfect. Flawless. It covers all my sin, past, present, and future. Everything is covered right there on the cross. Nothing left behind. Everything is paid for. Hallelujah. It's paid in full. I am secure. Therefore, since my salvation is secure, my joy is secure. Amen. Amen. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. We can be strong, folks. It's not a, you know, a, a self-meditating, um, whatever, whatever, nothing, none of that. It's a knowledge of the security of the cross. Go back to the cross. When you, when, you, when you worship here in the morning, sometimes some people say, oh, the worship was good today. Has it ever been not good? <laughs> well, I feel it today. Oh, I get it. So it's good when you feel it. And it's not so good when you don't feel it. Let's, let's dissect that a little bit more. How come you don't feel it? Well... Psalm 100, verse 4 says what? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Now, thanksgiving is your deal. <laughs> Are you thankful or not? Are you coming in here thankful that your salvation is secure, that the joy of the Lord is your strength, so that no matter what's going on in your life, you are thankful, therefore you enter the gates. Why are you thankful? Because you saw that Jesus died on the cross for you to pay all your debts. You know, in the old times, in the Old Testament times, you know, um, to enter the presence of the Lord in the Holy of Holies, there's three, three steps there. First is the courtyard, the holy place, the most holy place. So in order to get into the presence of God, first, first thing, you enter the gates with thanksgiving. Why? There, right there in the front, the first thing you will see when you enter the gates of that Moses tabernacle is what? It's the altar of the burnt offering. What is it talking about? It's the sacrifice that needs to be paid in order for you to be able to enter God's presence. Somebody needs to pay for your sins. Otherwise, you cannot enter the holy presence of God or you burn up. So what is the source of the thanksgiving? It's the sacrifice. Whose sacrifice? Jesus' sacrifice. So why? So when you come in the morning here, the first thing you need to see is the cross. Because that's the source of your thanksgiving. And if you understand what that's for, if that, that cross is for you to pay for your sin and that you've been forgiven, that you're accepted in the beloved, that nothing, nothing can separate you from the love of God, oh, who can be not thankful? So you're thankful and you enter his gate with thanksgiving. You just enter into his presence. You are in God's presence. Why don't you feel it? It's because you forgot about this. Because you enter here and it's like, oh, I want to feel something. Hey, it's not, a, it's not a magic place here. This is all coming from an understanding of what Jesus did for you. Hallelujah. That's not my sermon. That's not my sermon. I need to go back to my sermon. Hallelujah. I don't know. But I just want to tell you the joy of the Lord is my strength. So 
We were talking last week about the fortunes of Jacob's lands being restored. God is going to build on your ruins. And the palace, the, the worship will stand in its place. And then there's songs of thanksgiving, sound of rejoicing. They will, and God will add to our numbers. Hallelujah. And they will not be decreased. And he will give us honor and we will not be disdained. I say amen to that. I say amen to that. And that's what we need to believe. That that's what God wants. Now the problem is it doesn't always look like that. Throughout this year, this is from the Lord. However, there's going to be times that it's not going to look like that. And you start wondering, is that wishful thinking? Because as long as... As you're walking on this guilty sod (laughs) right here on earth, my goodness, I tell you, stuff can happen. So, actually this year, all our churches are talking from, are are, are studying the book of James in the theme of greater blessing. So, here it is, the book of James chapter 1, verse 2. Consider it pure joy. Everybody say pure pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials... Of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. I don't know about you. I don't like this very much. I mean, I like the pure joy, but what's following seems contradictory to me. Because normally, when I'm in... When I'm facing trials, I don't consider it joy. Maybe perseverance or uh, enduring or something like that. But this is the words of James. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Is one kind not enough? Many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And when it doesn't really, you know, make me happier. Because whenever I'm in trials, to tell you the truth, I don't care that I'm going to be increasing in perseverance. Anybody like, oh, thank you, God, I'm increasing in perseverance. I can feel it. Like, like who cares? (laughs) I don't know about you. Maybe it's just me, but. Let perseverance finish its work. I I still don't care. That you may be mature. I don't care. Why why, why do I need to decide to be mature? I'm old, okay? And complete, not lacking anything. Here is the problem. I am not interested in the things that God is interested in. It's it's obvious God, in, in, in God's mind, these things are important for me. Not lacking anything, mature, perseverance. In his mind, it's important. Not in my mind. I just want relief. From trials. I want it to go away. I don't like it. I don't care if I become mature or not. That's not my prayer. My prayer is, remove this pain. Don't don't say amen. Because (laughs) that's... Not where we should go. (laughs) I'm just confessing right now. That's who I am. And I know, like, dude, preaching this message makes me realize that what I want and what God wants sometimes are not the same thing. And I, if anybody should change, it's not God, right? It should be me. I think a lot of times we waste our time trying to get God to change. And we... John, Pastor John Mendes just said that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's written in the book. It's, he's never going to change, so give it up. <laughs> if anybody's going to change, we need to change. So we need to change to make what is important to him become important to us. Right? Right? And we waste so much time doing what? Getting God to change. So that what we want and what we think is important become important to him. And we are storming 
heaven's doors, <laughs> trying to get him to change his mind. <laughs> like, dude, it's a futile exercise. The sooner we come into terms with his will for us, the better it will be for us. Can I good a heart and hearty amen? amen. Yeah, yeah, I know it's painful. That I hear that pain in that amen. But trust me, this is, this is going to be good for you. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives gener generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Wow, all that? For this one thing that I'm not even thinking about or interested about, the crown of life. Who cares, right? Well, God cares. So I need to care too. The crown of life. I don't know how many of you felt like, yeah, crown of life. Never thought about that. <laughs> right? It's, it's about time we think about this thing now. Going to preach about it now. God wants us to be interested in some things that are important, eternally important. He's trying to get us off from just thinking of this whole thing on earth all the time. This endless cycle of, of, of temporal stuff. And lift our eyes up to what truly is important. Something eternal. Amen. So... I know it's kind of confusing because uh, joy and trials are not usually spoken in the same place. But that's where a big misconception comes in. This is the big mis misconception number one. That the blessed life is a life without suffering. That's a misconception. Because suffering is temporal. No matter how great your suffering here on earth, I tell you, the minute, the, no, no, the second you step into heaven, you can't even find a trace of that anymore. The memory of it is gone. Swallowed up in the glory of the eternal. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I mean, we get a little glimpse of it. I mean, the pain that you experience you know, in the past, I mean, you remember it, but it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, I don't want to speak on behalf of the ladies who, who, who went into labor and give birth, but from what I hear, I mean, during the thing, oh my God, you know, I, I still remember. I, I, I took the class. I took the class, infant care, uh, Lamas, the whole thing. I even took the breastfeeding class because I was an interested father, right? When my, my, my first daughter was about to be born, and I, I, I know how to coach her in the breathing. I know how to the, do the massage, everything. I'm, I'm going to be a super husband, you know. But the minute she went into labor, I remember, 5 o'clock in the morning, I was asleep suddenly, the, a claw, you know, it's like, it's time, and you know, I was grabbed so hard, and I, I went into panic. Yes, it's time. Off we go to the hospital. Then the labor comes, and she, oh, and it's like, I know how to handle this. <clears throat> I learned in the Lamas class. <clears throat> Immediately, I went to massage, and she screamed, don't touch me. Oh, there goes the class. Oh, okay. I don't know how many hours I learned how to massage. It's, don't touch me. That's it. It's done. I'm finished. <laughs> the second time it happens, okay, maybe I can coach the breathing. You know, as I started, said, shut up. There, there goes the second class. It's gone. <laughs> Man, she was not friendly that day. She was not friendly the whole day. After it's done, don't even 
There is no trace of that pain anymore. You know, can you imagine us stepping into heaven? All the trials, all the pain on this earth will lose its meaning. But here we are spending so much time and effort trying to get God do what we want. Things that are temporal. We want our temporal relief because we have this misconception that the blessed life is a life without suffering. So let's chill a little bit about suffering. If you live on this earth, there's going to be suffering. The longer you live, the more suffering. You learn to live with pain. I mean, when, when you're in grade school, you come home crying because somebody was not nice to you. When you're in high school, you come home crying because your boyfriend cheated on you. When you're in college, it, you, you see a pattern. It's increasing. It's increasing. Pain is increasing. So deal with that. But there is, there is a good thing about this. Number one, suffering sharpens your character. God is more interested in how you become than we are, than we, than we are. I mean, he is, he is interested in what we become. We are interested in what we can get right now. But God is interested in the process, what it makes us. He wants us to change into his image. Each suffering is a, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity. Now, suffering does not automatically make you a better person. It depends on your attitude. But suffering really is, a, is, a, is, is an opportunity. First, suffering makes you more empathetic. You can empathize with people that are, that are, that, that are suffering the same things. It opens the door for you to minister to other people. And secondly, suffering teaches us to love God for who he is rather than what he gives. It teaches us to love God for who he is rather than what he gives. If you never experience suffering, how do you know that you really love God for the sake of God rather than for the sake of your own pleasure? How do you know that if you've never been through suffering? This is what Job had to go through and come to the point that he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And even when my whole skin is destroyed, in my flesh I will see him and I will worship him personally. How my heart yearned for him. That's how I know Job really loves to worship God. Because <laughs> that's what his situation is. In another passage, Job says this, Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. Wow, that's something really deep right there. James chapter 1 verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters. When you face trials of many kinds. This is... We can consider it pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds because God uses suffering to make us mature and complete. That's what he wants for us. He wants us mature and complete. Now, if you have a little kid, you ask that kid, do you want to be mature? The kid will not care. Right? When, when, when babies are, you know, when babies, when they're crying, all they want is a pacifier. I learned that trick really fast, you know. Well, <laughs> wow. Then I buy so many I, in every corner of my house. I have it. Such a great thing. <laughs> but, but it would not be funny when you become an adult and, ah! <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Sometimes you have to deal with that. Discomfort. You got to deal with the with the with the with the suffering. What is it for? You cannot just ask for pacifiers all the time. Screw it. Getting mature. Getting, 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 getting uh, more mature. 
Doesn't it sound very much like this passage in 1 Peter 1? In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. I think Peter has been talking to James. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, which is of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though re refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Then again, during trials, usually that's not our prayer. Oh, Lord, may these trials result in the genuineness of my faith. Maybe it should. Maybe this morning I introduce this concept to you. Next time you're in trials, think about the genuineness of your faith. Why not? It's what God wants. Not just pray for the relief. Not just pray for the pacifier. But pray for the genuineness of your faith. It's easy to talk about it, but even me. When I go through stuff, I instinctively pray for the stuff, for the things. I'm sick, I pray for healing. I'm broke, I pray for money. Of course. However, as I do that, now I, I, add, I add something to it. But Lord, besides that, <laughs> I am also interested in what you're interested in me. I want my faith to be genuine. This thing that I pray for, I pray because I know it's God's will. It's your will. You want to bless me. You want your children to prosper. You want your children to be healed. It's obvious. He bore stripes upon his back so that we can be healed. Of course it's his will. What kind of parents want their kids sick? Of course not. But Lord... Whether I get the healing that I want today or not, I want my faith to be genuine. Because one day I'm going to meet you, and at that time, my decision today has to result in praise, glory, and honor at the coming of your son. I want to be a praise and glory and honor for you. Bring me memories of my, my mother-in-law. She's a godly woman. Uh, he was ordained as a pastor, evangelist in 1956. And um, preached all over, all over. Powerful evangelist. Thousands are healed through her ministry. Then she got cancer. Oh, I, oh, I hate cancer. I, it's one thing I hate the most in this life. Mm, 11 years she was suffering. When it was inoperable. And nobody can do, it, can do anything. She suffered for 11 years. She has a room in the back of the house where she, where she goes when she needs to scream so that her husband doesn't hear her screaming. Throughout that 11 years, she still prayed for people and people got healed. Even on her deathbed in the, in the hospital, I witnessed it myself, people were grabbing her arm and putting... Her, her, her hand on their heads and she would pray for people and people got healed. And I was like, God, come on. What? Like, I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I thought, obviously she has faith. She still pray for people. People got healed. Does she have faith for herself? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very close to her. And I, I talked to her and said, she always say, Jesus is the healer. Well, you're getting worse, mom. Well, Jesus is the healer. Not once in 11 years of that horrible suffering, she ever doubted that Jesus is not good, that Jesus is not the healer. Now, to me, 11 years is genuineness of faith right there. I mean, if you pray and the next three seconds somebody got healed, well, it's God anyway. It doesn't say anything about your faith. So it's really weird for me to see how this whole media machine, that uh, if, some, if a pastor prayed for somebody that got healed and then everybody was, is, is, is amazed at him and, and, and worships him and sends him money. I, I don't get it. 
because it's God that heals, has nothing to do with us. <laughs> you pray somebody got healed, God healed the person, doesn't say anything about your faith. But if you pray 11 years and nothing happens, well, that's faith. Faith is this suspended thing, this suspense, like I believe in God's word, by his stripes I'm healed. But I'm hurting. And it's not happening. Why is this? There's this tension between truth and fact. There's this tension between the truth of God's word and the reality that we face. That is faith. How genuine is our faith. Amen. And God wants us to have a genuine faith in his infinite, infinitely good mind, according to God, this is the greatest blessing. This is the greatest prosperity. Not in human mind. Human minds want stuff to happen. So suffering sharpens your character and suffering strengthens your confidence. Suffering reveals our mixed devotion and encourages us to put our hope in God alone. Strengthens your confidence. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Uh, I, I often pray for myself, Lord, keep me in the fear of God. You know, I, I met a friend from 20 years back, and he was ministering together with me and all that. And then I met him and said, I have a crisis of faith. What do you mean you have a crisis of faith? Well, you know, I don't know if, it's, if, he's really, if he really cares, if he's there or what. I said, no, you don't have a crisis of faith. You, still, you, you, you look smart enough to understand that, every, that God is there. All you are experiencing is that you want something and you want God to do something for you, but he didn't do it. That's all. Then he said, he asked me, in your so many years I've been walking with the Lord, 38 years, have you never had a crisis of faith? And I had to think, because that's a long time, I'm thinking, did I ever have a crisis of faith? And I have to honestly say to him, No said how come I, I think again and I honestly this is my answer because of the fear of God I realize he does not owe me anything he does not need he does not need to explain himself he does not owe any explanation to me he is God who are we that we should matter I have the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you lack wisdom, ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to you. You know, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 10. This whole thing about confidence. This whole life on earth, what God is trying to do is to shift your confidence from yourself to Him. Because Hollywood keeps saying, believe in yourself, believe in yourself. You know, have confidence in yourself. No, no, no. God is trying to shift your confidence from yourself to Him. Amen. Isaiah 50 verse 10 says this, Who among you fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of His servant? Who walks in darkness and has no light? Wow. When I read that, I've, I have, I, I've gone through that in my life. I've walked in darkness and I had no light. I don't know where God is. I don't know where this is leading to. I remember three years uh, in Arcadia when economy was upside down and our building, we have tenants went bankrupt. We were in deficit, $25,000 a month. 
for three years. I was walking in darkness. I don't know what's going on. Have you ever walked in darkness where you have no light? You don't even know where God is. You don't know what God's plan is. I have been there quite a few times actually. But here's what it says. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely upon his God. So next time you walk in the dark, remember this verse. Trust in the name of the Lord. Confidence in him, not in yourself. Confidence in him. Shift your confidence from yourself to him. Learn to trust God in the dark. God didn't tell Job, you know, after three chapters, he's still talking to Job. <laughs> Life becomes so bad for Job in that first three chapters of the book. He didn't say that in chapter 42, things are going to turn around. I mean, as far as he's concerned, he's in chapter 40. He said, it, this might go another 100 chapter. He was in the dark from chapter 3, from chapter 2, from to 42. 40 chapters right there. And then just like that, things turn around. Because why? Because it doesn't matter anymore. Because it doesn't matter anymore. Job got where God wants him to be. said, though you slay me, yet I will trust in him. How many chapters is gonna take, will it take for you to come to that point? My suggestion, less is better. Can you trust God with the singleness of God? This is the, the, the verse that I just mentioned to you. Learn to trust God in the dark. Who among you fears the Lord? Let's always start with fear of the Lord. Ask God to put that fear back in your life. Fear God. Don't get casual with Him. Obey Him. <laughs> Some basic stuff. Then you can walk in the darkness with no light because you trust in the name of the Lord and you rely upon your God. Suffering undermines our self-confidence and reinforces our God confidence. Amen. And lastly, suffering shifts your perspective. So, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord had promised to those who love him. This is a different perspective. God is teaching us to have a different perspective. To keep our minds on Him. Keep your mind on things above, not on things below. Right? That's what the Bible says. It reminds me of this verse in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Verse 2. You shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way those 40 years in the wilderness. How many know that 40 years in the wilderness was no fun? It was no fun. It was in the desert. There were snakes. Remember the snakes? I hate snakes. It was not fun. They, they eat, but just one thing. I mean, no variety at all. To humble you. There's a purpose for that. To humble you and test you. To know what was in your heart. Ah, apparently God is very interested to know what is in your heart. Not just what you do, what you profess, what you perform. But what's in your heart? How many of us really have the desire? Lord, know my heart. S search my heart and know my heart. Because I don't want anything except to be one with you. I don't want anything. I'm not asking for anything. I just want to be, I just want to be with you. I just want you. Amen. whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you. Oh, here's a shocker. Allowed you to hunger. <gasps> would God do that? Apparently, yes. He would. He 
He would allow you to hunger. How many of you know that hunger is not fun? It's not comfortable at all. And fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. Apparently that's important to him. That you know that we don't live for the physical only. But man lives with every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's important to him that our trust, our desire, everything we want, is not just on the temporal, it's not just on the physical, but in his eternal word, in him. There's the greatest blessing. There's the greatest prosperity. Amen. So it's an invitation of, not, of a, a life that is not shallow, of a Christianity that is meaningful, not manipulative. You are in this relationship for love, not for stuff you can get. Isn't that the, just the yuckiest thing ever? Pretending to be in love just to get stuff. Right? We should be in love because we're in love. When we lift up our hearts, our, our hands, our soul to Him, that it would genuinely be just desiring Him and nothing else. I believe that is the greatest prosperity. That's the greatest blessing. God will give us all kinds of opportunities, including suffering. Because suffering helps us to understand this deepest part of His truth. And so we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. That's us. We love Him. We are called to His purpose. Everything will work together for good. Everything will not be good, but everything will work together for good. Just make sure you're looking in the right direction. Let's make sure that your hope is in Him and your focus is in Him alone. In Christ, our pain is never in vain. Amen. Let's stand up together.